Hey, a pleasant, happy day, everybody. Hope you're having a nice end to the year and you're going to have a great new year. We have the wonderful guest, Alex Clark, back again. We did a Mariners video on the offseason with him a couple weeks ago. Now we did yesterday. That came out today. Check it out. A tribute to Kyle Seeger that I'll link at the end of this video as well. But Alex, first and foremost, how are you doing? Is In this video, we're going to be going over the NL and AL West and the moves they made this far and could make going forward. No, yeah, always great to be back on the show with you, Joe. Um, I'm looking at everything, and this is a very interesting topic for both of us, considering that our history, how we met and how we did everything, was by doing a podcast very similar, just kind of covering all the West teams. So getting back to talking about this, getting a little bit of nostalgia going back for me. So I'm very much appreciative and looking forward to that. Getting back to the roots. The roots of the of the Overtime Heroics West podcast. Yep. But um, <clears throat> first and foremost, later too, we're going to do something cool, which is try to, obviously more moves are going to be made. So we'll have to do an updated one once the lockout comes back and moves are made. But for now, we're going to make a prediction for the divisions later in the podcast after we talk about some of the moves that thus far were made. A team I would like to start with, though, that obviously did really well last year, more so because I'm always a big proponent of how underrated keeping the guys that brought you success is rather than continuing to do the whole, oh, well, let's continue to flip people because there's, mm. this guy logistically looks better, but even though this guy did great for us. Where the Giants, for that reason, are the team I want to start with, also mm. because it proved Gabe Kaplan was not the problem. Sorry, uh, the rest of the Phillies fans. That are <laughs> but um, Alex Wood obviously came back. Logan Webb, talk about developing pitching. They developed that dude into a very solid pitcher. Um, and then you also brought back Anthony DiScofani. And there was rumors they were trying to bring back Gaz uh, before the um, lockout. So, But then he obviously signed, so they're not able to do that now. So we'll have to see. What structure do they go to going forward since there was rumors about that? Who do they turn to? Do they get Granky as a veteran? But they had they did bring back a couple guys that did really well for them. And I always like that structure of keep putting confidence mm -hmm. in your guy that did well because that's then an organization I want to go to because it shows loyalty to free agents. Like If you're like, oh, well, even if I sign a one-year prove-it deal here, if I do prove it, they might give me a good three-year deal or something mm -hmm. like that. And definitely, no, that's one of the things that the Giants have done well. I do want to say, though, that it is definitely a blow to them not signing uh, Kevin Gausman back. Agreed. Because it is, again, he's a he was a Cy Young, uh, not winner, but a Cy Young uh, okay. candidate. And now that rotation, wherever you lose an ace like that, that's going to hurt a lot. But you take a look at the rest of the guys, and they've got some really good names on it. Logan Webb really outshined last year, and he's, I think, is going to be the ace going to day one, regardless of who they sign. After that, it's you got Anthony DiScofani, like you said, Alex Wood, Alex Cobb, even on top of the, with that. Yeah, they I brought a they Cobb who had a good season with the Angels last year. That's a good point. That's a solid, uh, exactly. small Cobb under was a really radar good under thing. Yeah, he was a good under-the-radar pickup that is someone that can really do good stuff, but, you know, just doesn't always get the kind of recognition from it. And so I do think they need to get one more starter, but you're right. I really like the whole idea of bring back the guys that have that have worked well with you because in the adage of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, or in the adage of red green, if it ain't broke, you, ain't, you aren't trying. But I like what I'm seeing from the San Francisco team, and if <sighs> – if what happened last year is no fluke, then I expect this team to do very do very similar things. They've brought back most of the main names, like you like we've talked about. It really does show a lot of confidence in this team. Though, again, I have to mention it again that losing an ace will hurt a team. And, so um, you got to work with that. And on top of the ace, you lost your captain. Mm -hmm, very Brandon true. Crawford's the That's other everybody. captain of your team, but. Buster Posey's been the dude on that team for years now, mm -hmm. uh, where Joey Bart, I think, will in time be a good catcher, but I do think he still could use a little bit more fine seasoning. So uh, you brought in Kirk Casale, who's kind of one of those under the radar, usually does really solid behind the plate, doesn't always hit the best, um, just solid catcher pickups. Uh, not mm -hmm. going to ever wow you at the dish, though. Um, but <clears throat> I think they did well there. 
uh, obviously uh, you have a guy uh, bringing in someone that's just a good career contact hitter in Tommy Lestella. We talked about contact rate guys, guys that just know how to hit before we started this podcast. Uh, he would fit into the category of nobody that's overly sexy, but just kind of just knows how to hit the ball and put it in play. If you have a good lineup around him like they do, if you slot him in a spot like second or something where he can just be a good contact hitter or eighth, where you like having good contact hitters at the bottom of your lineup or something like that, uh, that's that's a good spot to put him. Mm-hmm. Uh, Steven D- Duggar emerged uh, last year. You have your Um the, the one thing, because obviously guys like Slater, the other thing I'm thinking they might choose to add would maybe be one more outfielder because you have guys, yeah. like I said, Slater didn't do as well last year. Um, you have... Duggar, who emerged, Mauricio Durban is also an infielder. So do you want him to play the outfield or do you actually want him to develop in the future into playing the infield? So uh, particularly because Brandon Crawford's re-signed with the team for the future, but it's eventually you might end up moving him to second base from shortstop as he continues to age. Like you're going to have to see with how, because they already have shortstops in the system as well. So it's going to be interesting to see what they decide to do. But I think they're still going to be a good team. But on top of signing a pitcher, I would say my other thing for them would be maybe get another one of the outfitters that, or, or trade for Kepler. Kepler's been rumored in trades because the Twins are retooling at the very least, if not a full rebuild. So, um, mm-hmm. like, you could get somebody like that who kind of is another Yastrzemski type, not the best average hitter all the time, but is a good fielder that um, hits home runs and hits in the gap uh, pretty well. <laughs> Very true. And one of the outfielders that's still on the market for when I see it, if I'm wrong, please let me know. One outfielder that really made his name well known that I think could actually do quite well with the Giants is Jorge Soler. Really proved himself last year with the say, with the Braves. And so you take him, and I think he's a good fit no matter where you go because he's not going to be the best fielder, but he is going to be a guy that hits long bombs. And he's really kind of redefined what a lot of people like to see in a leadoff hitter. Most of the time, we look at leadoff hitters and we think guys like Ichiro, you know, the fast guys with the good slap single, get on base, take second base, and then the two, three, four guys try to knock him in. He's a guy that's going to set the tone early with a big, big bomb and just try to put you guys ahead from, from the get-go, which, you know, I think I can respect that. And on a team that, like we said, has lost Buster Posey, he, lost, he wasn't the biggest home run guy, but he definitely hit his fair share. And so you take that, and there's not a whole ton of real power on this. You've got Brandon Belt, who is a good defensive first baseman, but also can hit the ball out pretty well. Evan Longoria has definitely kind of got away from being a home run guy. And Yastrzemski is, I think, the best next closest after that. So getting a bona fide power bat could be a really good solution for this team going forward. Yeah, that's also why I wouldn't be surprised if from a DH perspective, they're one of the teams in on Schwarber too, because mm-hmm. that would give them a bonus. And plus he's let off in the same perspective of being a guy that leads off and provides the pop, not the um, old school leadoff hitter. You would profile a leadoff hitter um, as uh, the, that could be somebody else that would fit into that category. Somebody that I would look for, for the giants. Cause they brought in obviously guys like Dee Scafani was solid before, but had his best year there um, brought in guys like Wood who did good with the Dodgers has been trying to bring it back and did bring it back with the Giants um, and and got it going again, Um, where I feel like maybe a guy that everybody knows is a good pitcher but just gets banged up sometimes, I would say a veteran to add another lefty into that rotation they might look to would be Duffy because he's still on Mm -hmm. the market. uh, When he's healthy, you know what you're getting from Danny Duffy. He's a good strike thrower, has a good breaking ball, um, throws it in the zone. Uh, He's a good guy to have at probably like your third spot, uh, but yeah. he adds another veteran into your staff and he adds a lefty, which is something you always like having a very good other lefty. You would have two at that point in Wood, who looks like he's starting to find it back again. And he was obviously at one time a very good uh, pitcher in his younger days as a lefty before his injuries started happening. So uh, I think that would help there if you do that, unless if they want to, because there's not – much else they're going to do in the uh, perspective of being able to get the big time guys. Cause I don't see the giants playing pe- paying. I mean, Clayton Kershaw. Yeah. No, I don't need that. If they did, that would be fantastic for their fans. I don't see that. 
getting Clayton Kershaw. I don't either. But I could also see on the same kind of bit, like, I don't think they will. But there's the logic there of almost a panic buy of going for Kershaw because you lost your ace. And do you really trust Logan Webb to be your number one? I, th- I would. Like, I think that he's worth it, and I think he's a very good pitcher. But I don't know if you immediately – if you're in that front office, you just lost, you know, a Cy Young candidate. What do you do to try and replace it? You could try to go big, but that also means you've got to kind of cut corners in different areas. And if you really want to get an ace, is Kershaw at his age right now and at his ability right now really the guy that you want at the front end of that rotation? Which, in my answer, is really no. Yeah, yeah, I don't think you want to overpay for someone that I think will still be good and has a chance mm-hmm. on how we've seen um, different guys recover on new teams, um, where he was good still with the Dodgers, but he just wasn't the same boss, Clayton Kershaw, at 34 almost now uh, as he was before, which is understandable. But I still think he could do well somewhere, but I'm not, I'm not seeing the Giants paying him 100 million dollars if that's look at where... Danny Duffy's more in their affordable line, and they can still get a pretty good uh, lefty. Or if they could go more veteran, they could, I guess, get somebody like Granky, uh, who would fit yeah. more into the Cueto territory of just being a solid innings eater at this point of their career that still give you pretty good innings. Exactly. But, but we pretty much, I think, dissolved... Uh, what we thought um, was good um, from the Giants, that they were a good, wise team to keep the guys and bring in some other talent um, thus far. But I still think, obviously, like we said, they should add an outfielder. And as you said, they should add another pitcher. And I agree that they should Mm -hmm. add another pitcher there. So that is our thoughts on the Giants. We'll come back and loop back um, at the end to talk about uh, where we think they are going to finish in the division. But let's now, uh, we'll do back and forth so we can uh, entertain both of our side back and forth. We'll start with the top team of the AL West next as uh, we'll talk about the Houston Astros who are going to have a big loss um, be- unless if they are f- able to find a way somehow to re-sign them, uh, which would be Carlos Correa if he does not um, end up staying with the Houston Astros. And it's going to be interesting to see. They did bring in uh, Hector Neeris from my Philadelphia Phillies. Um, that Mike was a signing they made uh, <laughs> yeah, in the uh, offseason. And um, that's a pretty good signing, I think, for them. But they haven't really done much else, the, the Astros, at this point pre-lockout. Um, they did bring team... back JV, though. Bring back who? JV, Justin Verlander. He was re-signed. Oh, yeah, too, Verlander. Well. Yeah, yeah, Verlander. Yeah, that's true. Verlander was re-signed, too. I, I think I just assumed that was going to happen in my head that I just, like, forgot that even. <laughs> and, like, and that's, like, for my hockey fans, I just knew Tuka. Like, everybody knew Tuka Rass was going to sign with the Bruins, and he just did. When he came back from injury, it's like, well, he's not going anywhere. I just <laughs> knew, like, JV wasn't leaving the Astros. But, um, yeah, no, that's true. He did. They did re-sign uh, him, which is a big thing, because he's one of the leaders of that locker room. Um, and then also, um, as I said, they brought in Hector Neeris, but they're a team that I think is not even close to done. Uh, they were a team that got basically just wrecked by the lockout, uh, probably were in negotiations with a couple guys out there, and then just couldn't basically get anything going. So I think they're not close to being done. They should probably add another infielder unless if they think a prospect is going to take – uh, the jump to be able to fill that hole because you're going to have to fill that gap with just one of the stopgap guys. Like I think Inglacius is still on the market. Like get maybe mm-hmm. a good stopgap guy for the time being until a prospect or somebody you think yeah. you're going to get in a future market is available. Definitely. I think that their main thing they need to be looking for again is an infielder. Because right now you take a look at their infield and it's always been one of their biggest strong points. You got Yuli Gurriel at first, Jose Altuve at second, Alex Bregman at third. And right now it's really looking like Elenmi's Diaz is going to be the starting shortstop, which I don't know how confident you are in that. Elenmi's Diaz has always been kind of that person that is um, more of a... Uh, he's been more of a utility guy, one that can play everywhere, not the guy you're going to want to see play every day, 
but one that is going to try and be a solid option to be just a, a gap filler. And so I see them trying to go for, because they just lost out on Correa. I, I think they could try to re-sign him. I, I'm not going to throw it out of the, um, I'm not going to throw it out yet. I will say I've heard them link to Trevor Story more than a few times. So I think at that point, that's probably going to be where they're going to go. They could look into getting another outfielder. Because right now you've got Michael Brantley, Jordan Alvarez, Chad McCormick, and Kyle Tucker as your outfielders outfielders, especially since they dealt Miles Straw at the trade deadline to the Indians. But Jordan Alvarez, I I trust in the outfield as much as I trust as I trust a toilet paper roll to, he went to take a uh, to hit a uh, trailer. Yeah. But he started well with the Indians too, I remember if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah, Straw's done Stroll. well with them. Yeah, where like I remember watching a game at the end of the season where their announcer was like, well maybe the Indians found at least in like a fielding, uh, hitting well enough perspective, their center fielder for now as they're retooling this team. His his whole strength right now is his speed. His speed and fielding is really what his game is, with timely hitting needing to be developed on. So you know he's a good option for the Indians, especially. But it also means that he's not on well, the Astros. For the right now. Now. What? Oh, sorry. Yeah, the Guardians. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes, the Cleveland Guardians. Yep, that's yep, that's yep, that's it. All right. Uh, <laughs> but even then, still, I do think they could try to go for an outfielder. Just because I don't know how much you really trust Ches McCormick to lead the center Every field day. option. But, I mean, Michael Brant- Brantley, it's McCormick's still McCormick's similar to the Philly situation. It's basically like, unless if, like, how you have a very good guy that's emerged and had his moments like Matt Veerling, who, like, you want to have on the bench next year to continue to develop. But you don't necessarily want to be going into the season going, okay, this guy's our 162 straight to the moon mm-hmm. starting uh um outfielder which which that's where i i agree with you um they should uh potentially add some guys there the other infielder i was thinking of that they could potentially get um other than inglacius that would be kind of at a higher level of what inglacius does but hits more than inglacius usually mm-hmm. if they can't get story as a stopgap i would say for the extras would be simmons because in yeah. and simmons is more in that like b plus player category where like Inglacius is like B minus like uh does it does what he needs to do type like one of those like does what he needs to do type players feels the position really well hits well enough but like is a contact rate guy not anybody that's gonna wow you RBIs or anything why so like I could see them going for uh that t- that type of move if they can't get a uh, Trevor Story. Hey, don't be don't be knocking down on uh, my guy, Mister Utility Legend Andrew Romine, here to be a potential uh, option here at shortstop. First of all, yeah. Facebook actually, but uh, no. Anyway, no, yeah, I th- I think they could go for a stopgap, especially trying to save a little bit of cash at this point right now. So I see them going for an Iglesias or a Simmons that player as well. I don't know if they'll go for Story or Correa, but I just heard both of them linked to the team. Um. So I think that this team, I think if they're if they're gonna sign one player, if they're gonna sign one guy, I would probably go in the outfield. Just because the problem that I see right now is that Kyle Tucker is good is good defensively. McCormick is one that I don't know how much I trust to lead the center field brigade. And Brantley is not that great defensively, let's be honest here. So I can see that maybe yeah, trying he to go in a defensive. And now he's definitely not. He's too he's exactly. lost his He's a little, yeah, he's a little slower now. Not quite, doesn't quite have it. So I can see them maybe going for a more defensive option in the outfield just to have an extra thing ready to go. I don't know. There's a few names that kind of jump out to me. The first one of these actually is a Kevin Pilar that, you know, mm-hmm. not the best defensively, but, you know, good, decent bat and can be, you know, a good stopgap as a good center fielder until they exactly. figure out a little bit more what's going what they're going on with it. Maybe until they get a better outfield market, maybe potentially next year. Or they bring Jake Marisnik back. Oh, uh, true. Marisnik could also work too. Yeah. Yeah. Marisnik. Marisnik is more of a uh, fielding first uh, hit second uh, type of player. So um, he would kind of fit into that category of, um, Play as well, and then another cheap option. Not the not as good of a fielder as these other two, but is a solid gap hitter. Um, would be Brian Goodwin if you want to not pay overpay for an outfielder that might be able to hit you a 
decent mm-hmm. amount of like home runs and have decent RBI pop like he did with the Angels for a couple seasons. Um, where uh, he's one of those guys you can sometimes get really good seasons out of him for the cheap. But I would agree. I would say for the Astros, um, an outfield uh, and an infielder will probably be the most things they're looking for. Because when it comes to rotation, you still got McCullers, you got Ordo yeah. Rizzi, uh, you got Javier that's developing. I mean, you got you got a whole uh, realm of people, and then you got other guys coming up. You re-signed uh, Verlander, you got Forrest Whitley, from Valdez. So, I mean, yeah. like, I don't necessarily, unless if I guess maybe they Granky wants to stick around and be a veteran in the staff, like, I don't see them necessarily getting another starter. I don't either. I will say, though, if, like, there's one name of that of those five really jumps out to me, and that's from Valdez. Valdez really took a good leap in 2021, and I expect him to do the same kind of this year because this is what I'm a little bit worried about. Lance McCullers Jr., I think, is going to be the ace pretty soon. JV is a great pitcher. Do not get me wrong. He's a good, very, very, very good arm, and even at his older age, he is still a very dominant starting pitcher, but I think Lance McCullers is going to take over for it because we don't know how much more JV really has left in the tank. But Robert Valdez is one that has just continuously impressed the more that we have seen him. And I think that he's going to be a guy that could even challenge Lance McCullers Jr. for being a potential ace candidate on this team. This team is really stacked with talent. And when you take a look at the starting rotation, there is so much talent that people don't even think about. Because, yes, we have JV and Lance McCullers Jr. that are, like, the two top ones. People know who they are. Then you got Valdez, Luis Garcia, and Jose Yerkidi that are really what I like to call the the under-the-wire guys. They're guys that are going to get you a lot of good innings. They may not be the the most flashiest of pitchers, but, man, they've got good stuff, and they know how to get hitters out. Yeah. No, I completely agree with that. I think um, the rotation is pretty lock, stopped, and barreled. So we went over the first-place teams last year in both West Division. Uh, let's move into the second, the surprise second place team in the NLS last year. The Giants overtook them. Uh, the LA Dodgers, who are going to obviously, I think this is a quick team we can kind of go yeah. over. They're still, <laughs> gonna, they're still going to be competitive last year. They brought in a pitcher who has nasty stuff, but has never been able to figure it out since his first season with the Angels in Andrew Heaney. So we'll see if the Dodgers are able to get him to put everything together. Obviously, they have great catching with Will Smith. Uh, you got Gavin Lux, who's going to get more and more playing time. Um, uh, so I think, obviously, Bellinger, I don't think, is going to have back-to-back crap regular seasons, at least in my, in my opinion. So you're going to have him play at least solid. <laughs> I don't know if he'll turn back to being MVP Cody Bellinger, but he'll definitely not hit 190 or whatever the hell he did. I don't, I don't yeah, think. Sure. Um, where Pollock... Uh, is uh did really well with them last year, so I think this team is pretty filled out. But they're the Dodgers, so they're gonna they're gonna add somebody else once the uh, lockout comes back because they're the Dodgers. So they always they always, they always <laughs> gonna the add somebody. Uh, whether it's even just bringing back Granky since he's been there before, and they have him as another veteran in the staff since he already has been there. So uh, like uh, that's something they could do at a other level. The most interesting thing with them though is what the hell is going on with Trevor's case? Because he exercised his 2022 option. Obviously, everybody knew he was going to do that. He's not going to go into the open market with a <laughs> criminal investigation. Um, so uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that goes down because having him in your rotation compared to not, depending who the Giants decide to trade for and or add during the season next year, if they're still really up there with them, that can be a difference maker there, obviously. Definitely. And when it comes to the Dodgers, I mean, they're just so good. Like, they just have so much talent on their team. Even if Trevor Bauer does not play, I mean, they still got Dustin May there to be a good number five. I mean, Dustin May is another guy that people kind of just keep forgetting that he has a dominant sinker and a good slider and is just a really strong, good arm. Oh, no, he's ridiculous. Underneath that yeah. massive afro of his, he does have an arm. But that's exactly it. Like, the other thing I will say is that we brought Cody Bellinger, that he really took a step back this year. 
Like, he was a guy yeah. that at the beginning of the year was supposed to be a like, potential of the MVP candidates. And to quote MLB The Show 21's ratings adjusters, he ended the as he ended the regular season as a bronze after being a diamond. Yeah. That's just that's about as far as you can go. And then you know got up and started after the playoffs. But even if he goes down, guess what? They've still got Chris Taylor that can move on into the center field position, and then and then put Gavin Lux over at second base. This team is so good that no matter where. They have problems. They, well, they can still fill have to that for his tail, though. We have to remember because he is in the um, free agency. He's one of the free agent guys out there. Um, I'm pretty sure he was he resigned. Um, yeah, he signed a four year deal with Los oh, Angeles. Okay. Oh, he did. Oh, okay, never mind. Yeah. That. I thought I no, thought. he signed. A, and that's the thing about Chris Taylor. Like as much as you know, I have my own personal vendettas kind of against him because he was horrible as a Mariner and then became an amazing player with the Dodgers. Leaving it there. Um, I think that what he does is that he is the true definition of a super utility that he can play anywhere. And so if anyone, literally anyone has any problem, he can go fill oh, in that I position. Oh, I know why I missed him. He's listed at the depth chart at second base right now, where last yeah. year he was listed in the outfield. So yeah, that's, exactly, it, that, yeah. that's why, that's why I got confused there. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. He did. That's recently. fair. Yeah. So he is right now at second base. Base and if if St. Fellow has problems, hey, just slow him back in the center field and then, and then put in Gavin Lux. Oh, is Justin Turner having some problems at the dish? Well, hey, let's go go put him at third. Put Gavin Lux over at second base. Gavin Lux makes it so that Chris Taylor can play anywhere, and you're not losing a whole ton. And it's really cool to see because that's what this team really has. You're right, maybe a pitcher could be a good way to go, but I mean, do they really need it? No, like, but they're the Dodgers. Like that's yeah, why. They're the Dodgers, so they could add in something. So they're probably going to end up get, adding something else. I will say I do get a little bit worried with their outfield defense because Bellinger is, I would say he's good defensively, but he's mostly because of his arm. Boogie Betts, very good defensive outfielder, very very good. Mm -hmm. AJ Pollock, not so much. He's he very was much at one time. At one point in time, yeah, he was a fantastic defender. Now. Not so much anymore. He's much more of a DH now. But again, we don't know if there will be a universal DH this year. We'll see. So yeah. maybe it could go for another defensive style outfielder. Um, but I don't know. I think at this point right now, they could honestly add nobody and, and they would be still be favorites for being the NL West. No, exactly. NL. Yeah, yeah. That's why I said we can just kind of say this was our quickest team this far. We yeah, also exactly. didn't even mention Trey Turner is the best infielder probably of that entire team. Oh, 100 percent No, Trey also. Turner. Yeah. The fact that they still swung that trade to get Trey Turner and Max Scherzer for last year still blows my mind. I know they gave up a lot of people like Josiah, but yeah. man, the fact that we saw Trey Turner and Max Scherzer leave at the exact same time, oh my gosh, it was insane. Yeah, and go to the same club. That was absolutely ridiculous. Well, the second place club, um, we've already talked about this club, obviously, as we did the full offseason report up to this point on your Seattle Mariners. So uh, we'll go quickly around this one as people can watch that video uh, that we did a couple weeks ago on the Mariners. But your Mariners have Giles coming back. You talked about the bullpen. The bullpen stacked. Uh, you brought in Robbie Ray. You got the first ace back there since King Felix is uh, um, out there. And then uh, obviously as well, we talked about how J.P. Crawford now is going to step up as a leader on this team with Kyle Seager retiring in the uh, Seager video. You brought in Ty France, who became a massive success, and he was more of just a guy that was put into a trade um, at, at one point. Um, so it's going to be interesting to um, see how your team goes moving forward. Kyle Lewis, one of the most exciting outfielders to watch. But your team's <laughs> definitely um, in a good spot, I think, and should still be regarded as being in one of the top, top spots of – uh, that division coming into this year, particularly because the Angels, or not the Angels, the A's are taking a big step back. The Astros, if they don't get somebody to fully fit, like if they don't get story, you're not fully replacing Correa's skill. Um, so you're not, you're going to have, you're probably going to naturally take a step back. The Rangers are the team that you think is going to take a leap with the way that they're spending and going to spend after the break. But, like, I feel like your Mariners are definitely in a good spot in that division. Definitely. Right now, Seattle is taking advantage of a very weak AL West. And, I mean, they need to. When you're at the longest playoff drought in North American sports, 
you, you gotta do something about it. And they have. Getting Robbie Ray is something that was a big priority for the team coming in this year. You think getting Ray or Gaussman, and Ray, in my opinion, was the better of the two. And they got him. So now the team, as you said, has the first A since King Felix. And um, you brought up other names. So I think Kyle Lewis, if, if he gets to stay healthy, is going to be mm-hmm. an amazing player on this team. He but could be an MVP like, candidate. He could be an MVP candidate. He won the oh. unanimous rookie of the year. Yeah. But, oh, man, the problem with him is he just keeps getting injured. Um, the other thing I kind of want to bring up a little bit, we, we touched on it lately. This bullpen is absolutely loaded with talent. And even looking at the depth chart doesn't really tell the full story. They have four guys listed under closer because they're all people with good closing experience. Drew Stackenreiter, Paul Sewell, Diego, uh, Diego Castillo, and Ken Giles coming off. Um, he's still 100 miles Giles. Then on top of that, you had guys like Casey Sadler, Andres Munoz, who's looking to have his first real season in the big leagues, Anthony Vesevich, Eric Swanson. There's so many guys here that really could do their job well. I'm glad so really you said his name because I always mispronounce uh, Anthony's last name. Yeah, Anthony Vesevich, <laughs> yeah. It's that definitely a cool. hard name. I, don't ask me to spell it. I can just say it. And that's because I've said it enough times. The biggest problem I see with this team right now is they do potentially need another infielder, but I would say I like them also trying to get another starter. And I'm not talking about getting another Robbie Ray. I'm talking about getting another back-end type of guy so then like Justin Dunn does not have to be the number five. Say that like again? Cueto stays healthy, basically. Oh, yeah, no, I would love to see a Cueto in Seattle. I would love to see a Cueto in Seattle. I would love to see. There's a few different guys Duffy. I would like to see. Duffy would be fun. Uh, what about even, say, guys like bringing back J.A. Happ, even for like one season, would be interesting. There's, there's oh, a man. lot of guys that are interesting. Tom Wester's also an innings eater now at this point of his career at the bottom. True. Very is. true. And, like, just so that you don't have to have Justin Dunn be your everyday fifth starter. If, and even if that, uh, that makes it so that if you want to do like Seattle did last season and go with a six-man rotation to start out the year, then you have a competent number six in Justin Dunn. Um, the team has also been highly linked to guys like Trevor Story, especially, but they would have to move over to third base with the departure of Kyle Seager, and everyone knows that J.P. Crawford ain't going nowhere. I so, do think Trevor Story might profile, though. After his injuries, he had his worst fielding season uh, recently, so it yeah. seems like this might be the best time to move him to third base. Exactly, which I think even he realizes that and is okay with that idea because he's still – it doesn't affect his batting. He's still a good power hitter with great speed too. Just don't make him be at the position that requires all that range in shortstop. Let him be a good third base. I'm fully okay with that. Because yeah. now as well, one of the other moves that I can't believe just keeps getting forgotten by everybody is Seattle traded for Adam Frazier. He's an all-star last year. And yep. a very, very good utility guy. I think guy. It's because he dipped with the Padres so people forget about him. Like, he went so sure. well with the Pirates, and then his Padres stats were not as the team will be talking about him next, but um, d- dipped down a little bit. Uh, where um, I love Adam Frazier, though. Like, I applied I for teamwork for a job that was actually with the Pirates last year, where, like, you got to be in, like, meetings and everything and he was one of the guys i was like well if i get this job i know i have no input or anything you just get to be in the meeting I'm like, we are not trading this guy in the offseason because we're gonna get his uh and then they waited to trade him and got solid uh return for like mm. prospects um better than i think they would have got if they traded him in the offseason because he had a career year so i think they did that well um there for sure uh did the trade to the padres and then obviously uh the Padres then uh, moved him on to y'all because it seemed like Frazier was more of a stopgap for them when they got him because of injuries and stuff where uh, they got him more to do that. And then for y'all, he's going to go back to, I think, fitting in perfectly in the lineup uh, to just be the pure contact hitting ace um, that he is that got him to being an all-star. It's not You don't want Adam Frazier to have to do like what the Padres were sometimes calling for him to do because of their injuries, which is kind of be like almost Chase Sutley where he was like the – the like s- smooth swinging guy, but that could be the big RBI guy. That's not Adam Frazier. Adam Frazier is the great contact, one of the best contact hitters in the league. That's going to hit well in that aspect, kind of like how LeMayhew always um, did. The guy like DJ LeMayhew, not necessarily someone you want to be like. Well, ninety. Although LeMayhew developed into that, but in his early career was more of like the contact guy. These guys aren't guys you want to always have up in the spots. You want the Anthony Rizzo's or the Bryce Harpers or the 
um, even the Kyle Lewis's when they're healthy, obviously, or the Kyle Seegers who we talked about last year that or yesterday, I mean, that retired. Um, so like, but uh, they're still great players. You want up if you just need that single, or if you just need that um, base hit to win it. Those are the guys you want, and I think that's why he's going to mix into the lineup because you got the power, you got the big bat still um, with the guys like Kyle Lewis, aforementioned, and also with Mitch Hanniger, who we talked about as well. And then if Evan White, who we've seen the minors have a power swing, if you hang on to him and he can kind of get that power swing a little bit more. Um, the that problem was- with the problem with Evan White right now is that he does not have a position anymore. They were talking about trying to move him to the outfield, but but with the emergence of Ty France being not just a good hitting first base, but also being a good defensive first base. Well, who would be your DH right now, though? Right now, there's a few different people that are looking at the DH spot, and I don't want to put Evan White in DH. His bat is not good enough to be a DH. His, his strength is defense. So right now, our defense, it depends on who's playing in the outfield at the moment. But right now, a lot of guys, I would like to have Hanniger be the most time DH, although I will say Luis Torrens really made a good name for himself in 2021 as a designated hitter. Um, but, like, there's a few different names that are interesting, especially one I do want to note with Adam Frazier, is that I think he's going to slot in as the leadoff hitter for Seattle next year. Again, a good contact guy that's going to try and set the table early on. That's, that he, yeah, like that's that. probably what I... Well, that's the most I've been hearing, is that he's probably going to be a leadoff guy. I don't know, though. Because um, right now, my projected outfield for this team going into the going into what I think is going to be opening day if there's no other moves made is that it's going to probably be Kyle Lewis, Jared Kelnick, and Mitch Hanniger. Okay, that's right the other question I was going to ask you before we moved on for the Mariners. Do you think Kelnick, um, after showing signs but hitting in the 100s and showing he might still want a season a little bit, he would make it right away? That's that so, would be but, one of my questions. But obviously, yeah. you just answered that question, so. <laughs> Yeah, so what I see right now when it comes to Kelnick is that he really started to figure things out at the end of the season. Like, he started out bad. I'm not going to lie. He did. He had trouble. But one of the things I've been noticing is that at the end of the season, he really started to pick things up. He got a lot more patient at the plate. He was starting to figure out a little bit more of that cleaner stroke that he had when playing in the minors. Um, and one thing, this is a little bit more of an insider thing. I actually know and have talked with his uncle. Uh, because through some of these other fan pages and all that. And they talked about, as he talked about how he even just talking with him and looking at him as a family perspective, I can't believe I'm using this in an actual podcast setting, but talked about how his mindset is so different than it was even a year ago, where the mindset is a lot more mature, a lot more clean, and a lot more strong than it was a year ago, especially when, take a look at, remember what was going on about a year ago today. Seattle was in a really really weird place because they had Kevin Mathers that was talking about the team and what is going to happen. Like, Oh yeah, we are intentionally we're uh, using abusing Jerry Kelnick's arbitration status to make sure that he plays longer with us. And Oh, you say Kikuchi does not deserve to be on like is going to be gone after this year because we don't want to have to pay for an interpreter and all these other horrible things. So right now the team's mindset was really bad going into the start of the season. So now seeing that that kind of change is really starting to take effect now that Mathers is gone, I like seeing that. I think Kelnick is going to be probably one of the biggest examples of that. Yeah, I mean, all things, uh, he did still have 14 homers and 42 RBIs in the end, even while not having the squeakiest average. So, yeah, like he did get it working um, over time. That's for sure. You also have Julio Rodriguez. So, I mean, a uh, good outfield prospect, uh uh, for sure. So uh, you, you have enough of an embarrassment of riches, I think, uh, when it comes to figuring out that outfield. Jake Fraley, we talked about. We won't get into him now as we move on, but we talked about him in the Mariners video as well. Yep. Um, so if you want to see that, let's go there. But we talked about Adam Frazier, which is a good segue because we're getting to – I don't think this team's that long to talk about um, either just because the thing that's going to be the most – um, dependent for the Padres, other than like guys like Ryan Weathers developing uh, to go with the Blake Snells of the world and the Denison Lamets of the world um, and the U Darvishes of the world, and you have Clevenger coming back, the rotation is going to be good. We we, we oh, yeah. know that. Um, the lineup also looks like it should be pretty solid because you got Cronenworth, Hosmer's in between, but I still think it's kind of 
damned by people more than he should. <laughs> like, I've always thought that about Eric Hosmer. Mm-hmm. And then Manny's Manny. Fernando Tatis is one of the most talented guys in the whole damn game. The one thing you could see them adding, because Jorge Alfaro is listed on the depth chart as an outfielder, I would rather have Pat Burrell come out of retirement <laughs> and um, play a fielding outfield position than uh, Jorge Alfaro. So I would say outfield is the biggest thing for me that they should be looking for, like I mentioned um, earlier with the Giants, if they look to get outfield help in the corners with your shots, they could even be a team that looks for a Kapler on the trade market or looks for a Conforto to uh, add to the corner. Because you have your center fielder with Trent Grisham. You have your right fielder with Will Myers, unless you want to move him to left. So you just have to get a left fielder now, which is not that hard to find because you just have to get a solid fielder and Kepler, Conforto. Both of those guys fit into that category. And then if you get Pilar, for the for a year, then he fits into being a great fielder that you would have him left at that point. So, so my thing when it comes to the Padres overall is that you're right, they're an extremely talented team. You take a look at that rotation, and it is nice, extremely nice. My biggest problem with this team is the bullpen. You take a look at this bullpen, and there is not a lot of really great names on it, in my opinion. Emilio Pagan is your main guy. Austin Adams, Craig Stammen, uh. Tim Hill, Pierce Johnson, Luis Garcia, Hill, Drew Pomeranz. Too. Yeah, there's there's some guys there, but is it going to be really good enough to get you past the Giants and the Dodgers? I don't think so. Like, I think that's the biggest hole for this team to fail. Because I like Nola, again, former Mariner, that he's a good – he's he's good overall. Hosmer, like I said, I think he's very underrated now at this point. Cronenworth is good. Machado is Machado. Tatis is Tatis. And that Profar can still do some good work overall, and Grisham and Myers are Grisham and Myers. Yeah, so Profar is just an inconsistent fielder. That's why I was talking exactly. about that. from an outfield defense perspective. It's exactly, not squeaky yeah. as clean without Tommy Pham or somebody that actually is a good fielder also there. Mm-hmm, exactly. But right now, the biggest problem with this team is that I think the best reliever overall is Emilio Pagan. And Pagan is good. Don't get me wrong. Like, he's a guy that can slot into basically any bullpen in all of baseball. But I don't see him as a closer. I don't see him as a number one go-to closer guy. I think they need to try to add something more when it comes to the bullpen, which is always hard to do, just because bullpen names are always hard to get. But you know, there's a few guys that could be a, be of some interest. But I don't know where they're going to go with it, and I don't know if they're willing to spend the money on it because they have guys coming back to this team. They have guys like Clevenger that are finally starting to make their way back and other guys that are really going to need to find their way to make it back on this team. So, bullpen is the biggest need I see for this team, and I'm going to go full out on a limb here and say that if they do not add that bullpen, they're going to fall in the same rut they were in 2021. Yeah, no, I do think they do need to add some bullpen help. I agree with that because in the veteran presence, because also when you look, they could end up having a better bullpen than we think coming in because you have more at home who barely pitched last year. And you have too many guys that are actual classified as starters for your starting rotation. So, like, some guys are going to end up being moved to the bullpen. Like, imagine if Mackenzie Gore is a lefty out of the bullpen, dynamiting through people. So, like... There's different things there that could add to it. Um, and then if Paddock comes back and works his way back in through just being a like harder thrower because you usually tick the velo up when you're out of the bullpen and starts getting outs in that way after a struggle bunny season, then like that, those are like the moves we don't always think about. I feel like they need to add a veteran, like you said, but they could have a better bullpen because they have too many starters for starting slots if those guys actually develop, as we've seen many starters that don't make it as starters, like Zach Britton, who made fun of himself on Chris Rowe's rotation, saying I was a crappy starter that had to <laughs> had to mm-hmm. cut it as a reliever. Um, like, you see those guys develop. Drew Pomeranz is a perfect example of that, the one guy they have. Uh, go from being a starter that was just adequate to then being a really solid uh, lefty reliever since he's made the transition. So uh, I feel like they are a team right now, though, um, that I would say, since we technically gave it away, that I would peg as the third place finish in that division. Mm. Um, coming it shows how strong that division the, really is. Yeah, we, we even yeah, that's just how strong the division is. In any other division, like if they were in the American League West, it, 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 they would have a chance to win that division, and then mm. your Mariners would probably still be 
slotted in second where they're going into this season. I'll, I'll save that for later. Um, yeah. It could be a little bit different. But as we now jump back to the American League, this team's quick and easy. They're rebuilding. It pains me to say because of the former Philadelphia team. I love their history. I love watching them from far out there in Oakland. Uh, but I don't think this year is going to be all too squeaky clean and uh, oh, too uh, pretty. They're still trying to get rid of the mats, or at least one of them. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, so the, the, they're moving on from people moving out. They have guys like Honeywell Jr., who uh, you, you're going to see if they can kind of develop him, who was, of course, with the Rays, um, as they developed other guys like Caprillion into being good pitchers. Um, and Frankie Motus when he's not out, uh, and Puck. But, like, their pitching's not deep enough. We talked about they don't have deep enough pitching at all. They have guys like Bassett, who's been consistent since going there. Howell Honey will develop uh, Irvin that emerged last year. Caprillion, that's been good with them. But they don't really have a developed pen. They don't have proven guys out there um, at all, other than Lou Trevino. So um, I would say... You, that if you're going to add a little bit, I see the A's probably making those all the, like when they come back, those under the radar bullpen moves that nobody looks at as much coming into the season that they sign these pitchers that you go, Oh, they got nasty stuff, but never have been able to basically like the Phillies have this point. They made all these different waiver claims or like these little small moves for the bullpen. And then we're of course able to get Knebel in the end. Like they make those small moves, the A's, and then they turn them into being the next, um, like James Caprillion, basically. Uh, and then that's how they end up getting their good guys there. But or Paul Blackburn, who's had um, some success with them out of the pen. He was terrible last year, but and started a lot last year, which is but um, I, I think uh, the A's are a team that is going to finish not in a good spot. It's not going to be a fun season for them. That's all that's all the, to, to uh, watch record wise. But for guys developing. I think you always are going to have those fun surprise guys with the A's because you tend to always see that guy that emerges and has a good season. Like last year was Cole Irvin, like I said. I thought in Philly, we talked about it before the podcast, he was a guy that was destined to be an Iron Pigs pitcher. Goes to the <laughs> A's and becomes a quality 4-5. or five. So uh, you're always going to have that fun aspect of them being this, one of the smartest and wisest uh, in getting the under-the-radar guys, but they're not competing next year. No, they're not at all. In fact, that person they're fire sailing right now, trying to exactly. make sure they finish fifth right now. So, which, I mean, honestly, that's where I have them pegged, not to spoil for what we're going to talk about later. But, I mean, yeah, they just don't have a lot of pieces right now. Pitching-wise, like, it's kind of like you take a look at their depth charts. They only have four relievers on the team, and that's Dale Scar- uh, D- actually Dale is Guerrera, um, Sam Ball, Domingo Acevedo, and Lou Trevino. They just don't have a whole lot of pieces to work with. All the rest of the and, guys are minor league guys at this point. Exactly. That you're moving into your bullpen and yeah, seeing what they can do. Exactly. There's just not really much work, much to work with here. So they're still trying to get get rid of either Olsen or Chapman, the M and M twins. Uh, but you know, they're just not going to do well. This is definitely going to be a rebuilding year for them. They did well last year, but just couldn't quite get enough of what they needed. And this year they're just blowing it up because they already didn't have much of a core to begin with. So this is going to be just a bad year for the A's. I'm not going to see them really trying to sign any more guys, maybe a veteran. Maybe it's just some more little veteran pieces just to kind of, you know, try to play more of that money ball aspect. But they might like even, bring in an Iglesias. Like, they would be a team that yeah. would to bring in that, like, analytics-type player that's good defensively, can hit for mm. contact. Like, somebody like that trading for Definitely. a CD, like a Dickerson-type player, like something like that. 100%, yeah. So with that... I don't think they're going to do too much, though. They're just going to nope. basically be filling out the roster and going there, trying to finish as bad as they can, especially with the Rangers doing all the Ranger moves they're doing, which is funny because the Rangers are doing all these moves to finish it for. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, 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 have to, we'll have to see with what the, the Angels are always a disappointing. Uh, mm-hmm. We'll talk about the Angels, too, soon. Bunch, um, when it comes to how you think they're going to perform at the beginning of the season compared to mm-hmm. what they do. Now, these last two teams of the NL – um, I don't know about you, but I don't think there's a heck of a lot to really um, brag <laughs> about uh, when it comes to the Arizona Diamondbacks and the uh, Colorado Rockies. German Marquez is a solid uh, uh, pitcher out there. Garrett Hampson, a, fa- a nice fast runner, probably going to become a super utility player at some point of his career when he goes to some other team. 
Um, and then you got Charlie Blackman, um, who has the great outfield song every single time he comes up. Tonight. I went, oh, to a, but, uh, I went to a game over in Colorado this year, a couple games, sing. and it's yeah, so fun. I didn't know it yeah. until I went there for the first time, because I'd never even thought about that. And then just to hear, tonight, no, is one yeah, of the greatest cool. things I've ever heard in my life. And then the cool thing they do in Baltimore, not to get too sidetracked, but with Baltimore, they always do the O in the national anthem, like, because of the Orioles, like, in the one part of the ad, they're like, oh, and I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. That's that's awesome. like that. There's always different cool uh, things that different stadiums and stuff do. But, no, they got Tapia, who's a fun outfielder to watch. Eventually, he'll probably get traded to maybe a contender to be even a guy that's a typical, an old-school leadoff hitter, more so a fast guy that can steal bases for you. Blackman is a guy that I would think would end up being traded. This team's in move on from guys territory to bring in the next guys, basically. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be at the bottom of the division. I'm not going to spoil where I'm going to put them, but they're still not going to be a competitive team. You're just trying to watch them if you're baseball guys to see who your team might end up being able to get from the Rockies Mm -hmm. at the deadline. Like if your first baseman's injured a CJ Crone, for example. Exactly, yeah. And so what does both these teams, like for the Diamondbacks, there's just really not a whole lot to really work with. They've got Cattell Marte, and that's really about it. <laughs> They've got a couple other guys that know a little bit, but it's it's going to be a bad year for these two teams just because it's just, that's what's been the last couple of years. When you have three teams at the top of this division that really make it this top heavy, the rest of the teams just kind of are there. They're very much the afterthoughts. I will say, I do like a few of the players that the Rockies have, though. Like I said, I like Daryl Marquez. I think he's a good starting pitcher. Ryan McMahon is a very fun player that I like to see. Um, excuse me, Sam Hilliard is fun as well. And then Connor Joe is one I think is just a cool story. Um, and then Charlie Blackman, Chuck Nasty. I mean, it's Chuck tonight. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, like I said, Tapia, like all those guys. Brendan Rodgers is another good player at second base that's developing. We didn't even bring him up. So, like, Ooh, you got yeah. McMahon, you got some good developing players. That's why I think it's about you're going to probably keep those guys around, but you got to move on. Crone is more of a stopgap guy. You're going to eventually trade get assets for Blackman is at the end of his reign, I think, in Colorado, and eventually will get moved on. And then um, you have other guys you could potentially move on from. Uh, Marquez is always in rumors himself because he's now um, entering his age 27 season, I believe it'll be so. But no, I agree with you. Like they're they're not a team that we have much to dive into beyond that. Well, then you said with the Diamondback, beyond could tell Marte. Oh, go ahead. There's one thing I did want to say with the Rockies, though. There's one player to kind of at least watch out for. Garrett Hansen has been really interesting to watch over the last year. Another kind of utility guy plays second base and the outfield. But he is very, very quick. He's yeah. a very, very fast guy and that also has good defense. And people have to remember, he similarly to – and he's had more success at the MLB level than this guy I'm about to mention. Or Philly's prospect here, Kingery, they had mm-hmm. really bad bouts of COVID before um, anything was known about. Like, they were the guys that were like, oh, I could barely breathe, like – that they you could notice it when they when those guys first came back. I remember Hampson even saying in that first season, getting from first to third, first to home, it was a chore at times compared to how he's used to being able to do things. So now that he's further removed from that and getting stronger, um, I think that will um continue to help him out as well. But since we already mentioned the Diamondbacks, we'll just jump to the last team of the uh West last year. You obviously got Mad Bum as a veteran. Um you, you you got uh, other starters like Zach Gallion. I always like you started with the Marlins. Um, he's a pretty fun pitcher to watch. But uh, they, they don't have a lot there, obviously. Um, you just have solid compete guys like Weaver, Caleb Smith that are solid pitchers, but nothing that's really going to wow you um, unless if Gallion starts to jump like the Marlins once thought and the Diamondbacks, I think, think he's going to do when they traded for him, thought he would be one of their top two guys. If he makes that jump more than being a very good three, uh, then that would be a difference. But you could tell Marte's their star. Mm-hmm. Um, a guy that I think, though, might fit in. He's a good uh, fielder um, that I've watched from MILB TV play in the minors a couple times. A guy that I feel like might become a super utility guy for them at some point as other guys develop, will be that one guy, um, Van Meter, because he can kind of mm-hmm. play positions. 
and do everything. But the, yeah, they don't have much going. Just similarly, the Rockies, they're looking to trade out guys like Dave Peralta, probably who's a veteran, to a team that could use somebody uh, like that. You're probably you might even even though you kept them around for now, you might have kept Nick Ahmed around to eventually move him to somebody that would want Nick Ahmed. So mm-hmm. I think those are the guys you move on from to then have these younger guys um, be able to develop with your team. Um, even like if you want to continue to try to develop uh, Gilbert, who pitched pretty well last year, Tyler Gilbert, um, and the Zach Gallons of the world, you want to bring in different guys and not just have these veterans anymore that are aging out because you already have other veterans. Like, you know, you're not trading Mad Bum unless he does really good because of his contract. So, uh, you're going to have other veterans, but you can move Peralta and guys like that to bring in other guys. You can move Merrill Kelly if he's doing a good four or five starter numbers to somebody to be a back end of the rotation guy. So Exactly. So right now, I just I, I don't know what I want to see from the Diamondbacks and, and Rockies. I think mostly it's just keep on pace, develop younger guys. I would say improve just the wait. younger guys. Yeah, yeah just, improve just, the younger yeah. guys and just yeah. see where they're going from here because we want to wait and see how well are they going to work with the the when the inevitably the Dodgers, Padres, and Giants all fall. Yeah, exact exactly. Yeah, how these teams because they have I would say the Rockies are enough because we mentioned Rogers McMahon. They had a couple young guys that already wowed you where the bigger star now is with the Diamondbacks and could tell. But throughout the lineup, especially if Hampton becomes like that super utility guy, they have a few more guys we mentioned already where the Diamondbacks mm-hmm. don't have the guys that have already shown it at the MLB level yet to the that are going to continue to try to impress and get better next year necessarily. But we're now uh, head back to the American League as we cap up the last two teams of that division before we give our standing predictions to wrap this one out. Uh, the one that we do now is going to be uh, the Los Angeles Angels, who uh, finally decided that pitching is something that's important to a baseball <laughs> team and um, actually signed a good pitcher in Noah Syndergaard and um, are still going to have to sign more people because they need to have better bullpen help. They brought in Michael Lorenzen as well, brought in Aaron Loop, but you still want to um, do a little bit more, I think. But this is a team again. I think they're going to have, when you have Mike Trout, you have Anthony Rondone on your team, you're going to have expectations big time uh, going into the season. Um, I think it's about continuing. Moreno finally committed to pitching. When it comes back, continue to add out to the rest of the full uh, pitching rotation. I don't mean just starters, like the rotation to the bullpen. You probably still have to add to like, a couple more people in order for this team to actually be able to compete to the top of the division. Oh, hundred percent. And that's kind of the problem that I'm seeing with this team is that this looks like another year, same old angels, because yes, they added Noah Syndergaard. Yes. They added Aaron loop. Congratulations. One problem I see is that yes, Noah Syndergaard is an amazing talent, an amazing pitcher. He can never stay healthy. He just can't do it. When he's healthy, he's fantastic. He's a potential Cy Young candidate. But when he's not healthy, which is most of the time, he's dead weight. So that's the problem I get here is that they have Shohei Otani, Noah Syndergaard, and that's about it. Reed Detmers is okay. Patrick Sandoval, okay, maybe. Jose Suarez, okay, maybe. And then the I think that would just be a solid, like, for, like just location lefty at a given time. But the problem with the Angels is they always have to rush their guys up because they never get enough pitching. Exactly. So never let guys develop fully at the minors, and then that seems to bite them um, in the butt. Like, uh, Jaime Barea was kind of an example of that who's had his moments, but I think could have been a better pitcher if he could have had a little bit more time, but you don't have the rotation to give some of these guys more time. Exactly. And this team right now, it's it's full offense. That is the aim of the game of this team. With a line that includes Max Stassi, Jared Walsh, David Fletcher, Anthony Rendon, Renifo, Marsh, Trout, Adele, Otani. The name of the game is trying to score 10,000 runs. It's the, and the name is then to not give up 10,000 to one. Because that's always the adage I use with this team, is that it doesn't matter if you score 10,000 if you give up 10,000 to one. But... With this pitching staff, it just looks like it's the same thing. They are go- If they try to add more pitching, then great because they need hits. But, man, if they don't, 
this is going to be just another year of same old angels. They have amazing players on the team. This offense, you could put up against teams like, say, the Dodgers, the Padres. You could put up against all any team in baseball, and, it's, and it'll go toe-to-toe if not beat them out. But yeah. the problem is, again, don't have the pitching to do it. The pitch, it's basically like you have a – I'm going to use a golf reference here. You have a tailor-made, perfect, like, new driver, like an RX driver, as that's the offense. The pitching is you have a little dollar store. It's like a little garage sale, it's like a rusted out putter or a rusted out five wood that was made back in the 1800s. That's what yeah. I've got here right now. And because that's the thing, I feel bad for Otani, man. Like, if Otani continues on even remotely the pace that he was on this year, he's going to be an MVP candidate for years to come. He may be a unanimous MVP candidate for years to come just because of what he brings to the table. And that's saying something when Mike Trout exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Flag Guerrero exists playing so well at such a young age. My gosh. Like, there's so many good players. But Otani, if he keeps on this, just because of how the MVP, MVP award is laid out, he's just the winner. It just happens. And then you have guys like Trout that are being the best player in baseball. You have guys like Jared Walsh who really exploded in 2021. Look, this team is so good offensively. Just give them some pitching, please. Yep. And similarly uh, to needing pitching, as we move into our final team here, they brought in someone I've always liked because I thought get him the heck out of the Rockies organization in Coors Field. And this guy will have a better career. And that's John Gray. Um, So I do like that signing by the Rangers to have him develop and potentially become an even better pitcher than we've seen this far. Uh, But they don't have depth um, when it comes (laughs) to their pitching. Uh, They have another guy that might be able to give him time because his K to ball rate is fantastic. He just needs to figure out how to throw quality strikes is Colby Allard. If he can figure out how to throw quality strikes in the strike zone and be one of those more location artists like Jay Happ lefties, then he could be a good pitcher. It's just right now he throws too many meatballs. He doesn't have a walk issue. It's just he throws way too many meatballs that uh, just allows the the, the pitchers to be hit. But we saw a pitcher. That was the problem with Cole Irvin here. He could could throw strikes. He threw too many meatballs. The A's got him to locate more in the corners. Where if the uh, Rangers can get that to happen next year, that would be uh, big for them. And then they have uh, a guy that they're trying to figure out that well, just as the Phillies were trying to do, um, good old Spencer Howard, um, that's going to find his way into that rotation somewhere. Um, so they have a lot of different guys that are not fully proven. Brett Martin um, is more of a bullpen piece when before earlier in his career, it was, is he going to be a bullpen or a starter? Now it's, he's going to be a good lefty out of the bullpen for you. Dane Dunning's kind of one of those um, just good bottom end of your rotation pieces, which is a good guy to have, but you need more than that. Obviously when you're a team that brought in the offensive components that you brought in, uh, you, you need to add, you brought in Corey Seager, uh, Marcus Simeon, you're still rumored. You added Cole Calhoun, who's a pretty good power hitting outfielder that can field. Uh, you're still rumored with other people. You need to back that up now post lockout with getting the pitching you need, whether it's via trades or whether it's via what's still on the market. Like my biggest thing, I think the Rangers are going to do. There were rumors that Seager's already been trying. Is if he doesn't stay with the Dodgers, my biggest prediction is Kershaw is going to the Texas Ranger. Mm-hmm. Here's my thing right now. When it comes to Texas, they've done so much. They just spent nearly half of They spent over half a billion dollars within 48 hours getting yep. players like John Gray, Marcus Simeon, Corey Seager. The problem is it doesn't matter. And the reason why it doesn't matter is you take a look at the rest of the AL West. And while I said it's barely weak overall, that just shows how weak the Texas Rangers really are. They don't have a whole lot. And for John Gray, I feel bad for him especially. He yes, he's getting out. He's going out of Colorado, yes, but he's also going into the fly ball zone known as Texas, and that's not going to help out his home run for high rate at all. I'm going to be honest with you, it, maybe maybe just a little bit. But look, Marcus Simeon, very good baseball player. He's going to do very well. Corey Seager, extremely good baseball player, going to do very well. But when the rest of your lineup is Jonah Hine, Nathaniel Lowe, Josh Jung, Nick Solak. 
Adolis Garcia, Will, uh, Willie, and Cole Calhoun. And your pitching staff is John Gray, Taylor Hearn, Dane Dunning, AJ Alexi, and Spencer Howard. Oh, it just hurts. It hurts I trying to read. Yeah, for me, I feel like it's more pitching because Calhoun's kind of one of those tweener guys that he can hit. And now that you have the universal, like he he's one of those guys. I feel like he could have, he has a little bit more than he's shown. Uh, Dole is just kind of can he keep be go from being a surprise guy to being like how Rosarina became a surprise guy and then stuck. Is Adolis Garcia going to be able to stick? That's going to be the uh, thing. That's the question now. Will he stick going forward being a solid uh, uh, player there? Where uh, Solik has tools, it's just he hasn't been able to bring them all together yet, and that's why they kind of moved him into the outfield, try to mm-hmm. find him a position and all that. Uh, I, my my concern for them, because you can have a lineup that's kind of ruled by the core, and then you got Connor Falifa, who's uh, – not a bad hitter either. Um, no, yeah, kind of. Is, but that's part of one is, of the parts yeah, of that team is is the uh, pitching. The pitching is the biggest thing for me. That's good. Mm-hmm. But if you add extra pitching, you add another. Like they've been rumored to add um, some of the other hitters available, whether it is a uh, Conforto or somebody else that's out there on the open market. Uh, th- that's going to go a long way. And obviously, if you add Clayton Kershaw, that's going to go a big way in uh, helping out your uh, pitching rotation. But the reason I thought Gray will work better there is also the division. You're going to be in um, you're going to be in Oakland and you're going to be in Seattle pitching against those teams that you can get away with fly balls in both of those stadiums more so than you can get away with fly balls if you're playing in um LA um when it's warm in the in the summer and it'll fly out of Chavez Ravine and then when you're playing in San Francisco if you get the right weather in San Francisco that thing's going <laughs> uh, to to the bay and beyond uh mm-hmm. so um I just think the division as a whole will kind of uh work better um for him where even like um yeah, I'm just going to leave that. I feel like the division is a whole bit better for them, but their biggest thing is getting pitching. Where now, as we um, wrap up here, as we did a very long show, um, almost the length of how we used to do our AL um, or our Western podcast, right over an hour, I have written down, we already both kind of hit it out. We think the A's will be the last place team. Mm-hmm. The uh, AL West, is that correct for you as well? Exactly. Like, that's the thing. Yeah, I have A's as number five just because they just don't have any pieces right now. They're trying to go and they're trying to go and um, they just they're basically just trying to tank. You know, they have all the, they have trying to get rid of more pieces. They already didn't have any to like begin with, so they they just have the ends to work with. So at that point, and they're trying to get rid of at least one of them. So yeah, well, they got the ends, and then they still got um. Obviously, uh, um, what's that one? Uh, oh, Pinder, who's a pretty good super utility mm-hmm. player for somebody that you might be able to um, pick up as well. So I think uh, they're just going to be another bottom half of the division team. You got some guys you can trade. You're going to try to trade one of the M's. If Elvis Andrews does well, somebody might need a shortstop um, so, or a second baseman. So... Uh, there's different things there that can happen, but I definitely agree with uh, them finishing for fifth. That's for sure because they're in the full rebuild mode at this point. They're in the how you see the Athletics do every so often. It's a couple years they fall off, then they come back to being the A's again because they make all these random ass moves that you don't expect to do great, and then you're mm-hmm. like, where did this guy come from? And exactly. then that's just what the A's are good at. Yeah, well, one of the uh, better pitchers on the team for that season, like Chris Bassett, for example, when they got to the postseason. So. Um, let's move to the NL, though. Um, it's a race for the bottom of the division between the Colorado Rockies and the uh, Arizona Diamondbacks. Uh, because we gave the Rockies, uh, they did lose John Gray, though, but we did give them the um, nod on having the guys. like They have Crone, who's a good veteran. They have Hampson. They have McMahon. They have Brandon Rogers, who's developing. And they also still have Charlie Blackman, of course, and Ron Maltapia. I give the Rockies the better chance to finish a 
busted Diamondbacks, which is not saying much, like, but uh, to just to not finish last. And then I'm mm-hmm. still going to put the Diamondbacks uh, in last place in that division because yeah. they're, they're still in the full. They tried to act like they were ahead of where they were and then immediately found out that that's not what, what the what the <laughs> was like. Exactly, yeah. I, I have the same as you. Like, I have the Diamondbacks as last place just because, for the same kind of reason as the A's, they really don't have a whole lot of pieces. You can't build a team around only Cattell Marte. So, yeah, that, they only have one storm. At least the A's have the two Macs. <laughs> At the tomb, at the tomb, jeez, yeah. So at that point, I mean, that makes it very easy because we also talked. You know, the the Rockies do have some good pieces, but it's really just a battle of which piece of trash looks better. It's and, it's, and then the it's A's the also have Ramon. Don't they still have Loriano? I think. No, I think Ramon Loriano has gone. I think he had like a suspension. Uh, he might. Okay. They might still have. Him. I'm not sure though. Okay, got you, got you, but um. Yeah, I would say the D-backs would definitely. The, the other same thing is then um, I already hinted at it, so we might as well just go to that before we go back to the NL. I would assume you're going to also have the Colorado Rockies uh, in fourth place by default in this division with the way the Padres, uh, Dodgers, and uh, Giants are. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I got these ones in Colorado, so I thought it'd be fun to have that for just a moment. <laughs> Yeah, no, they're going to be my number four team. Um, I thought about joking and saying they're going to be the number one. They're going to win the division, but no, they're number four, not even close. No, which yeah, is kind of funny because, be like, down. yeah, it's kind of funny because, like, in both these divisions, the top three teams really do have a chance at going mm-hmm. for the top thing in both of these divisions. But it's really for the American League, it's really two teams, in, in my opinion. Well, for the American League, it depends who you think the top three teams are, too, because of how disappointing they are. <laughs> the Angels are basically the AL match, the, where the, yeah, they I come love, the season I, I love, with expectations, <laughs> and then it's like, oh. Uh, I do love me the Los Angeles Mets of Anaheim, but um, <laughs> just to make everyone angry with that comment. <laughs> but no, like, the Me- I mean, I wasn't the Mets. The Angels <laughs> are- <laughs> <laughs> the Angels are my number three team purely because I think that I don't think they have enough right now. They don't have enough pitching to compete with the Astros and with the Mariners right they now. Have better I think pitching than the Rangers. They, yeah, but they have better pitching than the Rangers and the A's, and their offense is already amazing. Like their their offense is good enough to carry them to compete in the division. But without that pitching, it's just not going to – it's going to make it them fall short. Yeah, yeah we've seen exactly. the story already. It's like Groundhog Day, and I'm just waiting for the for the piano to start playing. It's because, like, you have the – because the whole thing, like, you always have the lineups to compete sometimes, but whenever things start falling, it's the sports damning domino effect, right? Where, like, whenever something starts going really bad, like you're pitching or you're off, then it dwindles eventually into the offense. It's like in football. If your offense starts sucking – your defense will do good for a while, but eventually you're putting too much pressure on the defense and eventually it's going to dwindle into most aspects that you're going to go into a full run. So, like, that's kind of how things tend to go with the Angels. They have good start periods, and then they kind of go into that rut that has them falling on because they always are with the talent they have on their team, obviously, like the Fletchers, the Trouts of the world. You brought in Joe Adele, uh, obviously. Um, you, you all, They're always a fun team to watch. Um, so I usually tend to tune into a lot of the games, but they, it, it, it's upsetting to always see them fall off. So hopefully this is the year they're able to do better. But I also have them uh, coming in since we jumped the gun uh, to the third place team and skipped over the uh, fourth place team. Uh, I would also have them if the Rangers do not make more moves for pitching in third. But if the Rangers keep being the Steve Cohen's of the basically AL for this off season and just go, yeah, money is just an object and continue to have that mindset. Then I might change that one. When I say we do our updated standings, but for now I would have to have the angels as third, uh, mm-hmm. uh, which would then uh, lead into who we think would be the fourth place team. Cause it's going to be the Mariners or Astros at the top, whatever decide we decide to put that uh, the angels would be third, the fourth place team at that point, because I'm pitching, uh, mainly would be the Texas Rangers. Yeah, Rangers are number four easy for me just because they are better than the A's. But that's not saying a whole lot. So, yeah, I have 
I have Angels as number three, four being Rangers, five being A's. In At the, the same American time, League. though, I think, like I said for a video when I did my um, videos reacting to when teams made moves pre-lockout, I said for the Rangers, I think they had a good pre-lockout offseason. The problem is you can't be done. Because you still mm-hmm. have to fill out that roster. You spent yep. on the stars. Now you got to get the pitchers that are really going to help. You also got John Gray. Like you talk. Now you got to get the pitchers that fit into mm-hmm. your team also that are really going to help fill out that bullpen and fill out that rotation. That's why I don't think they're done. And then they might even still spend big on like a curse or something like that. So you, you have to see. That's why I'm saying when the post lockout comes back and we revisit after those moves, the divisions, that might be flipped for me. Or it might change drastically yeah. if the Rangers go ballistic. But uh, Definitely, we're yeah. have to see. Uh, we'll have to see. But for now, I would say it's A's, bottom, Rangers, Angels. Uh, we've been in agreement this far. And then it's D-backs, uh, Rockies we had um, for the West teams in the NL. So let's go back to the NL at that point. I think we both kind of hinted at this when we were talking about mm-hmm. the Drays. But the Giants, we like how they brought guys back. They just have to find the replacement mostly for uh, Gaussman and then also maybe someone else in that lineup to replace how Posey is a much better bat than a Kirk Casale or what Joey Bart is, at least at this point of his career, who's still developing. So you might want to, like I said, get an outfielder that will uh, lessen the blow of losing a bat like that because they also need outfield help. But the Giants are going to still be up up there. The Padres just by default. Uh, it's not because – we think they're a bad team whatsoever. I think the Padres, if they catch fire, could win the division. Because that's, yeah. the, that's just how good the NL West is. The Padres, just by default for me, because of how much I like San Francisco and the Dodgers <laughs> are in. That's all Definitely. it is. Yeah, for me right now, for the Padres, it's more about that their bullpen is a, big la- a bit lackluster of the three teams. I think that they have the weakest bullpen of the three teams, but the offense is still fantastic. And if they catch fire and maybe add another bullpen piece to it, these three could, uh, these two very much are a, you know, a shell game where any one of them could hold the, could hold the division by the end of the season. My guess though right now is that looking at this team at this exact moment, the pitching staff is fantastic. Their rotation is absolutely bonkers. But, yeah, they have too many starters, like I, like we were saying. When, when we went over it, they have too many freaking starters. Some of them are going to have to be relievers. <laughs> which that's, hey, you know, that's fine. You have too many starters to become relievers. That's fine. I mean, that just means you have better people in your bullpen. Exactly, because they need bullpen help, like you said. That could be how what helps them catch fire. Exactly, and that's what I'm kind of banking on with them. I'm not going to say that's exactly what is going to happen, but what I'm saying is that that sounds like, just looking on the outset of what I think is potentially going to happen, it's not going to work out perfectly well for them. I'm going to say they finish in third. Okay, yeah. No, yeah, I think that's the case coming in where uh, we'll go back uh, to the American League uh, for now to say who we think is going to finish in second. Again, we had the A's at the bottom, the Rangers, and then the Angels. So it's between the Mariners and the Astros. Um. We're going to see. This is going to be interesting Mm -hmm. uh, to see if Alex agrees with me once I say my second place team, uh, being he's the fan of the one team that's going to come into the equation here. Mm -hmm. Losing a certain somebody that I don't love his personality, but I love his skill, is going to be, if they do not get Trevor Story, very, very damning to the Astros. I am actually putting the Astros in second place. Yep. So, I'm with you. As much as it's probably the homer pick, the Astros, I think, are going to finish second because well, for me, of, it's not a homer pick, though, because I'm I not. I know. For you, it's not. For so me, it's it more, is. Yeah, it's more like I just see that team developing. I see the Astros taking a drastic <laughs> step back because you lost I agree. Uh, one of the best talents in the game. So. Here's the thing that's really cool about being at least a somewhat knowledgeable not sports a fan. That, step back, but a step back. A drastic yeah, step yeah. back is a bad way to put that. Yeah. One of the good things about being a knowledgeable sports fan is that you can make the homework picks and then try to substantiate them with facts. And that's what I'm going to try and do here. Right now, the Astros, we saw them take a bit of a step back in 2021. And now they're taking an even bigger step back without having um, without having guys like Correa on the team anymore, without having Miles Straw. Without have, we saw what happened as well when they didn't have uh, George Springer on the team. And now they're losing one of their other big-name guys. Yes, they're getting back JV, but JV's, I think, 38, 39 years old now. He's really getting up there in age. 
how long are you realistic realistically expecting to be an ace level pitcher? So here's what I'm saying. They have an amazing rotation. Their rotation is absolutely top notch. The bullpen needs a little bit of work, but still has really good names to it. I think that Sanek is doing well. Maton is going to be a really good reliever with them. They've got good names. The problem I see with them is that their offense is really starting to take a bit of that dip. Because now you're taking a look at that guy like Chaz McCormick is being an everyday player for you in the outfield. You have Michael Bradley trying to Diaz, be. Like you said. Exactly, yeah. You have these guys that the defense just really isn't there as much anymore. And if they do not sign Trevor Story or Carlos Correa, this team is going to take a hit. It's going to take a massive, massive hit. I mean, there are other shortstops that they could try to sign that would would definitely help out. Like if they were to get maybe, say, Jose Iglesias or Nigelton Simmons, that would help out. But right now, I see the Astros and the Mariners very close. I see them, like, right now, and this is not so much the homer pick. This is so more that I've been seeing where the Mariners have been going trajectory-wise. And, yes, they lost Seager. Yes, they lost 35 home runs, 100 RBIs. But they also lost a guy that was batting 211. And I'm not going to put any knock on Seager. He is an amazing player and one that is going to go into the Mariner Hall of Fame someday. But... I also think that right now this Mariner team has a lot of depth to it. They've got good young guys that are coming up that are almost ready. They've got a really good infield now that they have an infield that looks like this. Ty France at first base, Adam Frazier at second base, J.P. Crawford at short, and either going to be um, Abraham Toro at third base or Trevor Story or Carlos Correa, I think, is going to be Story. At third base. Now, when is Marte nice. rumored to actually be in the plans for your team? Say that again? When's Marte like... Oh, no, LV? Oh, he's, he's, still, he's still a ways away. Still a he's, bit he's still, I'm pretty sure he's still a couple years out. Uh, okay. So, yeah. The main people that I'm looking at that are coming up so are pitching guys like George Kirby that are coming up real quick. Um, that could really make an impact pretty soon, potentially even at the end of this year. I don't know. Maybe that's being a little presumptuous. But you no. also have Emerson Hancock as a pitcher. Yeah, Emerson Hancock's the other one. Yeah. yeah. Um has a um, great has has a great name that he's gonna get made fun for every time he gets asked for autographs. Um Can I please get your Hancock Emerson? Yeah, can I please <laughs> get your Emerson Hancock? Uh, the, um, <laughs> and at that but, point then he throws his ninety five mile par fastball straight at your nose. At you. But um Kendrick, I remember um uh, not to get too sidetracked it before we go into the NL ones, but we both have the Mariners at the top because I like how they're progressing too. And I mm-hmm. think they might still, like we talked about when we talked about them in the video, they might still look to maybe make some smaller, like fill out the roster uh-huh. um, acquisitions. So um, that's going to even help you further. Um, the, obviously, Mariners fans are going to be very happy with this because they're, they're trying to end this playoff drought. And maybe yeah. Kyle Seeger will go, you know what? Uh, I've been a dad for seven months. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're gonna... after, after five months, he's going to be – after five months right. of being with the babies every single day, he's going to be itchy to go to spring training. It'll be, no, no, no. It'll be, it'll, be, it'll be more like the second half of the season when he sees them in first place. Like, you know, I have never got the taste of the playoffs. Honey, uh, do you mind if I finish this season with the Mariners? Oh, no, go right ahead. Okay, perfect. Yep. What right. I would love to see, what would absolutely love to see is they sign him in, in uh, August. So then he could be on the 26-man roster for September call-ups. So he'll be able to play, but not always have to be right there. And so that he could be on the 26-man when uh, Seattle goes to the playoffs. That's that true. Yeah, be- that would be cool. That would be cool. Yeah, that could be a cool way to do it if that does end up happening. But let's finish it out with the toughest, I would say, to pick where the heck these two teams are going to line. Because of the loss of Gosman and not them – they brought in a Cobb that I like. They kept Wood. They kept DiScofani. Like all that, they have Logan Webb. They have four guys, but they don't have the other guy, how Gosman was emerging, and that's why he got paid, because he started getting better and better with the Giants. That's when he became the guy he is now. He wasn't that in Baltimore. He became that uh, with the Giants. So um, I think uh, they need to find somebody, like we talked about, that fills into the top of that rotation uh, in like either the three spot because they have Webb can be the ace like you said and they have guys that can be a two 
But you or or three, like these is a flip between the two threes. You have to find somebody else that's either a flip between the two three or trade for somebody that's more of just a steady two. Or if you get a veteran guy that will be an ace, you can still put Webb as your two for now and let him uh, develop even more. So because of the loss of Gosman, and also I, I feel like the Giants are going to make the postseason again, but it probably will end up being a very good winning wild card team because it's not just the loss of Gosman, it's the loss of replacing not just Posey as a batting lineup, but primarily the loss of your captain and maybe – getting off to a slower start because you didn't have uh, – you, you have to pick that up behind the catcher position where now you don't have one of the best bats at the catcher position until Bart develops. You have a veteran in Kirk Asali who's one of the best at catching, but not a very good bat. So I feel like those two things put together are going to lead to um, the Giants being a very good 90-some win wild card team um, that will get them into the wild card. But that's why I put them in – Second, but I still think putting them in second, they're one of the top contenders still if they make the postseason because of the veterans they have, the experience they have, that they're going to be another team that will add at the deadline again and then compete with the Dodgers to the end. But I feel like it'll be more second, and the big kahuna is what happens with Trevor. Yeah, so here's what I've got right now. Like, I'm just going to say that all right. I have not learned my lesson from last year. I want to say, if I had learned my lesson, I would say do not bet against the Giants. However, when I keep looking at the facts of what the Dodgers have, it's really hard not to bet on them. And so it's kind of with that whole thing of, yes, the dot is a yes, the Giants have retained most of their best players, except for Gaussman. Yes, they have a decent bullpen. Yes, they have an offense that's pretty darn good. And that Posey retired, of course. Exactly. Buster Posey retired. Um. I just look at the at the Dodgers and just think, dang, this team is really good. Dang, this team has a lot of talent. Dang, this seems like a, t- a team that some kid made on uh, MLB The Show 21 after turning off the salary cap but and turning on force trade. But, yeah, I'm going to have to go with the Giants at number two. Like, I just think that the Dodgers have too much. It's it's really sad because I want the, I really do want – the Giants to do well, and I think they are going to do very well, but I just look at everything going on, and it just doesn't work out to me. Like, oh, this is it, just I, a prediction. Logic, it just goes if against the logic. Mm-hmm. If I had a big fan-wise of these teams, this would not be... Now, Now the Mariners being in first, I'm not going to lie, might still stick, because I really do like watching that team, but I would probably have the <laughs> Angels in second with how I like the Angels and watching them. I, I've been a fan of the A's, but I'm, I'm realistic. They ain't doing that ever. So, like, if even if I'm a fan, I'm still kind of realistic how I rank people. If I'm doing a fan rise, though, I would, ha- I would have been uh, putting people in different spots because I would much rather see the Dodgers have had uh, – have been the big bad Dodgers. I would much rather see the Giants with Kapler's uh, coaching staff and everybody be able to – uh, overtake them and win again and get back to being the Giants that they were at one time with Brandon Crawford and not more so that they've been until last year of late where they've just been a scrappy team until last year where then they became very good again. Exactly, yeah. So I look at this right now and I think that the Giants had a great run last year. I think they're going to do very similar stuff this year, but I just think the Dodgers, what they have, especially in a weak division, like, well, I don't want to say weak division, and it's hop-heavy division that the NL West is. Exactly. That just kind of don't matter and having three teams that are all going to be competing. I think that just the strongest of the three is the Dodgers. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree with that. But at the same time, I agree with what we said earlier. Every it's it's a crapshoot in that NL West again, that anybody that gets hot at the right time, that's how the Giants won the damn division. They were so hot at the beginning, never got cold. They had a little bit of sputters, but they never got cold. And that's why they were able to, always hang on because they never got fully cold so um if they're able to do that again they can easily win but i it's just because of what you said you highlighted perfect i have nothing else to have with the dodgers they're just loaded i would project them coming into any season if they can keep this roster together to win it but if i had to say who i would want to win the nl west that would be i would like to see the giants win it again and actually do a little bit uh do their thing a little bit more um when it comes to getting deep into the playoffs and maybe uh, actually, if it's not the Phillies being a team that has a chance or your Mariners 
the DNT bat has a chance at that point to to um to win because I've always had Brandon Crawford's always been one of the fun guys to watch from afar at the shortstop position, one of the better leaders in the game. So uh, I always rooted for those guys, and I always loved Buster Posey, who's now retired, of course. But uh, I always did love Buster. So I mean, I mean uh, if you did love Buster Posey, then you were, the problem was with you, not with Buster. Yeah. And then Yaz, I love ever since he's come in the league, he had the interview with his grandfather, and not oh, the interview, yeah. but the video they did. Like it was always cool when they first came back pitch. to Fenway. Yeah, first the first pitch. pitch. Was, I, oh, that was yeah, so I, nice. Like I, I always just from being a. I have followed the Red Sox as my second team. Obviously, Jastrzemski's a big name to me. So as soon as Mike came up, I just started. And then they had the cool um, off-the-field stuff that they do, the videos. He's a funny dude in those. So, yeah, he's a, he's a cool dude to um, follow as, as well. Uh, but this is about wrapped us up. It's been a whole hour and a half. Jeez, oh, yeah, I was uh, going to say, we, we were going we, ham on this yeah. one, man. Going over the NL West and saying what we think is going to be the divisions. I have them written on this card. So we have what we have is now. And I'll write them on the back for what we're going to have is later and see what changes and see what's right. Because who knows? Maybe we'll be idiots when we change them. And the one we did first before they made moves post lockout will actually be correct. And then we'll just blame ourselves. (laughs) But Here's you know, the thing I've, I've learned that as a sport, as a sports broadcaster, and as a sports analyst, I've learned that really we're just idiots that try to use facts to be, to base things that are unpredictable. Like we try our best using the facts that we have available, but really we know that so much can happen in a baseball season. We don't know when a team's going to get hot. We don't know when a key injury is going to happen. We just think in perfect scenario, this is exactly where it happened, and then we realize, oh wait a minute, perfection does not exist. No, yeah, it's always there's always a chance. The, the 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 sport that was the most predictable for a while was basketball, um, for a couple going years there with the Warriors and everything. Um, but I agree, most sports are kind of in the realm of like you don't really know what's going to happen until until it happens. Um, at at that point, but. Again, I really thank you for uh, joining, Alex. We'll get to talk about some stuff again. Uh, this guy doesn't just know stuff about the West, so, I mean, we could re- re- recap some other divisions. It'll be shorter because we have talked mostly about the West. It probably won't be an hour and a half. But we can recap other divisions. The only one that would have a chance of being an hour and a half is if we do the East because the East are also my other cup of tea. Um, the yeah. East, so, yeah. But, um, everybody, thanks for joining us. Have a great, safe rest of your holiday season. Hope you had a great Christmas. Have a happy new year, and you can follow him at the Sports Guy 52? Uh, 242. 242, 242, okay. I always get, there's so many people with numbers that I know their Twitters in my head that I get them mixed up. Yeah, no so worries, many, man, you got it. So many times, so many times. We'll try. So they, you can follow Alex on Twitter. You can also find him at Overtime Heroics doing uh, the, um, what's the name of your guys' podcast? We do the name? podcast Cheap Seats Chatter, Cheap Seats which Chatter. we just did our um, last, we just did a recent one yesterday doing uh, more Jeopardy on MLB The Show 21 because right now we are having trouble trying to do ASR content Fine, with the lockout happening. Yeah, you you also uh, could do, I guess, like fun storylines of player type content. We are. If you start doing yeah, we've been, doing, we've, been, we've been having fun with our content. We've, yeah. we've been getting creative. <laughs> but... Again, everybody check out their stuff. Uh, you can find me at JJ Borick 26 on Twitter. Check out my stuff at Steel Flyers. Uh, that's an all sports network for people that like all sports. And then Flyers Nitty Gritty for people that are fans of hockey and particularly Philadelphia area hockey. Stay safe, everybody. Enjoy your new year. And um, hopefully this lockout is resolved shortly into Please. our new year. That will be what we hope is the MLB's New Year's resolution. Peace out, everybody. <laughs>